Okay, I, thanks Jeff, and I'd actually like to thank the Order of the Bee for the opportunity to be able to speak here. Um, how many people are here from Spain? Quite a bit. Okay, how many people are here from the UK? How many people are here from the US? Okay, pretty good turnout. All right, and everywhere else. <laughs> and, uh, that's not what I meant. <laughs> okay, um, and how many people are on Twitter? Okay, so you're allowed to have your phones out. All right, it's okay. And, and it's at John Newton up there. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to take a picture of everybody here, because it's the one opportunity probably that we get to take a picture of everybody. And I might have to put it into panorama mode, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, can we bring up the lights a little bit here? Can we bring up the lights so we can see everybody in the audience for a minute? Okay. I, I probably should have prepared this bit a little bit earlier. <laughs> so I'm using up my time. And as you, many of you already know, I worked on this presentation up until the last minute. Uh, as is the way I have been doing it for the last 35 years, I think. Okay, great. Time really starts now, right? <laughs> okay, so I, I just want to start with uh, some of the reading that I've been doing over the last couple of years, and I, I hope that reflects in some of the thinking that we've got in terms of our vision going forward. Clayton Christensen. Who's heard of Clayton Christensen? Just a few people. Who's heard of the innovator's dilemma? A, a lot more people. Yeah, the innovator's dilemma is the fact that if you're successful, that can be the trap that you get into in the future because you can't get out of that successful pattern, and yet the world changes. You need to adapt. And so Clayton Christensen last year said, after decades of watching great companies fail, we've come to the conclusion that the focus on knowing more and more about customers is taking firms in the wrong direction. That's sort of counterintuitive, like get to know your customer, right? What they really need to home in on is the uh, progress that the customer hopes to accomplish. This is what we've come to call the job to be done. When we buy a product, we essentially hire it to do a job. So the notion of hiring is actually a really interesting one. Are you fit for purpose for this job? You know, are, are you somebody that you would you know that you would want to hire to do a particular job? And we all have our specialties. We, we all have those things that we want to concentrate on. Now, when we look at our customers as a whole, in fact, all customers. So this is a survey that was done uh, with by us with 
Forbes magazine uh, that interviewed hundreds of Fortune 1000 companies and said, what are your business goals? And it's a lot of the same things that you would expect over the years. So things like uh, expand our markets, our sectors, uh, protect our market share against uh, disruptive competitors, blah, blah, blah. But, but look at the numbers. They're kind of even and consistent. So we could invest in all those things to help those companies work. But that doesn't quite work. You, you need to think about things <coughs> differently and concentrate and focus. And that's why in 2005, a group of developers were accused of starting transactions they didn't commit. These men promptly escaped into the open source underground. Today, they survive as top-ranked open source developers. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, if, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the A team. So there you have it. There's your mnemonic for what did you learn today. If you could just associate it with each of those characters. Now who watched the A-Team as a kid or whatever? Virtually every single person. I'm probably one of the few people who actually saw it when it first started as an adult. <laughs> and uh, that's because, yes, I really am from the 1980s. <laughs> So I finally get to introduce myself. I'm CTO and founder of the company. And again, it's at John Newton. And um, yeah, it was a fun show at its height um, in the US. You would get an audience of about 20 million people on that night. And uh, pretty successful for NBC television. And um, you know, I was just thinking, why did I not do this? So a team can mean whatever you want. Um, <coughs> For me, it could mean al fresco, or it could mean activity. The most important thing is, it begins with an A. Anyway, um, on a more serious note, um, I want to talk about the whole notion of digital transformation, which I think, when you look at those objectives of what people are trying to do right now, is they want to take the technology that's available and apply it more effectively. And it's not just companies. It's things like the US military, where you think of guns and weapons and helicopters and ships and stuff like that. And actually, sometimes it's stuff like being in Syria and helping out the community by being an explosive ordnance um, uh, handler to be able to disarm some of the IEDs that may be on the roadside. And that's exactly what happened to a chief petty officer who did not carry a weapon, but just wanted to make Syria a bit safer for the people who were there. Unfortunately, um, he was unable to uh, deactivate an IED. It exploded, and a few days later, he died. And it just kind of goes to show that there's a lot of people involved. The, the military calls them warriors when they're out in the field. There's warriors that carry weapons, but there's far more people who are actually there to support for the supply chain, all the boring stuff. But they still handle lots and lots of paper records. And one of those records is when somebody dies, that they actually have to write out a letter of condolence to the wife, to the parents, and they want to do that as fast as possible to help it, you know, the process of closure. And so it's not just about money and being, you know, the next Uber or whatever. It's actually using the technology to be faster, safer, more efficient, more effective, and engage the people that count. So that's what the U.S. Um, Navy is doing with us right now. And by the way, the Marine Corps are also part of the U.S. Navy. 
and, and so was that chief petty officer. Um, and so they're actually going and building applications that handle processes, look at all the different processes, including things like bereavement letters, but also things like making sure that people have the supplies that they need. Um, they could also have content available there. And they'll have governance services as well. So all the things that we provide are actually pretty fundamental to a lot of digital processes that are out there. And that's what we'd like to focus on here. And I'd like to tell you why it's important. Now, when we think about digital transformation, it can really mean anything, right? Um, so it's really hard to take a 1980s program and turn it into a digital transformation format. But um, I think one of the things that, did, that they did real, that was really cool was they could take anything and turn it into a tank. <laughs> you get Mr. T out there with the uh, welding equipment and he'll turn a, you know, a, a Chevy Nova into a tank if you want to, or a school bus or whatever. But that's probably not what we mean. What we mean is that we want to be probably a different type of business. And when we look at what's going on in the world of business right now, we can see there's lots and lots of examples of the old world being replaced by an entirely digital world. So anything from taxi services becoming Uber and Lyft, probably maybe a little bit more Lyft these days than Uber. Um, retail stores uh, being turned into Amazon.com and the Main Street, High Street, whatever you call it in the rest of Europe, uh, disappearing. Uh, it's things like music, hotels, and whatever, kind of disappearing overall. And yes, even government is trying to transform and becoming more efficient. And yes, Mr. President, you should have hired the A team, not the C and D teams that are out there right now. <laughs> but what, what are we doing to try and solve this particular problem other than avoiding getting blown up? Now, that same survey that I had in terms of what are the business objectives you can see there's a similar pattern here in terms of what are people trying to do with their digital initiatives. Well, virtually all the respondents, um, I would say like 80%, had some notion of a digital transformation going on in their organization. And uh, we use the term Peter but peanut butter a lot because you spread it. Um, there's a lot of responding to... Uh, and you're encouraging dis disruption. There's, um, let me make this bigger so you can see this. You can probably see it better than I can. There we go. Okay. Uh, make it easier for our customers to do business with us. Uh, make it easier for employees to do their jobs. Well, okay, so that's, that can mean really anything when it's all over the place like this. So, you know, we're looking at our customers, who I think are looking at the problem in a very different way and using those technologies more effectively. And what are they trying to achieve? One is they're trying to improve the way that people in uh, enterprises work and how they engage with customers. They're trying to eliminate physical things, particularly paper, and eliminate manual processes and improve the flow of information. So it's not just about getting rid of the paper, it's about actually improving the process and the flow of information. And as a result of improving the flow to actually extract out knowledge and insights and additional information out of there in order to be able to make better decisions. So that's a lot of the elements of what we see of digital transformation. And it's also about redesigning the process. In fact often redesigning businesses as a result of doing that. So before I used to have this loop, and it sure made me happy seeing this little loop, this dynamo, because what a great metaphor. Um, people just didn't get it. So let's make this a little bit more explicit. So when we want to take a digital initiative, the first thing we do is we make some decisions about what it is that we're trying to do. Then we design new products and services uh, based upon those decisions. And it can go back and forth. You know, Maybe there's no good ideas, so we go back to decisions. Then we develop and iterate on those. 
then we build and deploy these things because they're digital and now DevOps becomes an important part of our businesses. And then we engage and act. We, we, you know, the most important thing with this is to make sure that the customers get access to this. Again, there's a back and forth on this, but generally hopefully going in a positive cycle. Then there's observe and get feedback from the customers um, so that you can feed that back to the whole process. Orient and analyze the information. Um, start to take what is essentially big data and come up with some conclusions. Then collaborate on those and then make some new decisions. And then start the process all over again. <coughs> so from there, we can get processes that actually drive this whole bigger piece here. In fact, all the little bits here can be processes. And we can be collecting content and information and between them, actually start to get and search and analyze that information. So we can see these processes actually creating new digital capabilities as a result. But that's still pretty abstract. So if we take a leaf out of uh, Hannibal Smith's or Hannibal Cloud's uh, book here, if we ignore the obvious, because everybody's talking about uh, digital transformation. Isn't that all about technology and just kind of digitizing everything? Well, no, not exactly. But it's not exactly using a submarine to invade a desert hideout or whatever either, which is what you find some really crazy things on the A-team there. It's really about thinking differently. And I brought up some of this last year. Who was here last year? Well, VCon. Who was at VCon <laughs> last year? Uh, who was at La Rigotha last year? <laughs> One. <laughs> okay. Um, I talked about design thinking, um, and that's about bringing people in there, that people are very important in this process. Um, it's also about open thinking. And I talked about that a little bit in terms of open source is important, but it goes a little bit more than that. It's about open standards, open architecture as well to encourage innovation. And there's platform thinking, which is to harness the, uh, the power and scale of your digital capabilities to create new business models and new uh, business capabilities. Now, I won't go into great detail on this. We have a bunch of materials on the website if you'd like to learn more. And we are going to be doing a lot in this particular area. It's this last one that I really, really like to focus on because it's more technical, and VCon tends to be more technical. So first of all, maybe I made a big, bad assumption here. How many people consider themselves technical? OK, good. I made the right decision. <laughs> all right, so very briefly. Um, design thinking is about not starting with your information architecture. It's not starting with process design. You know, it's not starting with charts. It's starting with people. It's starting with the end user and understanding what they want and creating the use cases and storyboards, identifying them and creating personas um, so that you can test against the personas, <coughs> some of the ideas and concepts. Then you can iterate on your information architecture and your process design, and then bring in your other systems and sources and ultimately create digital solutions. Um, this is what agile development is all about. Um, and it's being brought into not just the development of software, it's actually being brought into um, development of business processes and development of new business models as well. Then there's open thinking, and this is Part of the reason that we went open source, um, part of it is just because there's so many great, tremendous tools that are part of open source, whether it's infrastructure for and tools for data, um, whether it's uh, services, integration, uh, intelligence capabilities layered on top of those services. And then, of course, we provide our tools as open source, as Alfresco and Activity. And then we bring in user experience and app development tools, which when we started, uh, it wasn't so much that it was open source. There was a lot of closed source solutions. And it's actually changed in the last five years or so, where basically everything in UI development is becoming 
more and more open source, and you see far fewer proprietary solutions out there. Then there's platform thinking. I did talk about this last year, um, but it's all about building a platform for growth and, and agility. If we take advantage of our economies of scale and start to collect our capabilities and make them digital, so whether it's information systems, our global processes, our compliance and governance, uh, you know, all the different elements that make us a strong and secure, secure company, but make them openly accessible, make them reusable, make them digitally accessible through open data, open APIs, open standards, and open architecture, then we can go at startup speed, even in the government, to be able to create new digital initiatives faster and faster, whether it's a digital initiative to deliver new records, or whether it's a new customer initiative to be able to provide them online information as quickly as possible, or maybe it's the Internet of Things. Making those all available and making them more accessible um, is the way that you can start to have an agile enterprise be able to solve a lot of these problems. Now, what problems are those? Now, if we take those three thinkings, and this was part of the research that was being done, what we found was that some people are practicing design thinking, open thinking, and platform thinking. And those that do uh, take those on are actually growing much faster than their competitors. And they're thinking about the problem of digital transformation differently. In fact, they're thinking about the problems of their business differently as well. So if we look at the digital leaders who are taking on those new capabilities, we can see that it's not spread out all over the place. We can see that there's some common patterns of problems that they're trying to solve, which is expand our markets within our current sector or new and adjacent um, sectors. So basically build out their market share. Then there's protect our market share against disruptive competitors, recognizing that technology is a big threat. Yes, they can use it, but it's also a threat to themselves. Um, also high up there is expand and develop new product lines and services. So really reimagining their business using these, tech, uh, these new techniques. That's what comes with a different type of thinking. And when we look at how they want to handle transformation, there's more clear differentiation in their thinking as well, which is make it easier for customers to do business with us. Make it easier for suppliers and partners to do business with us. Those are key elements of platform thinking, to take your core capabilities and make it available to your customers and also to exchange information more effectively with partners, vendors, suppliers as well. And there's a lot of companies that are actually taking these steps. And it really is just the beginning right now. So when we look at those digital leaders right now, there's a few that are ahead of the curve. Um, but everybody's heading there, and we're on the cusp of huge changes of these being applied in there in the basis of cloud, in the basis of creating platform, in, in, in the basis of appifying their, their enterprises as well. So an example of this, uh, they spoke at our New York Alfresco day recently, is Capital One. They want to engage their uh, commercial clients more effectively. And they're actually taking a lot of those concepts and saying these are critical to what we want. Um, they're very small, but uh, it's actually taking content and process and actually migrating existing information from other services and making those process and uh, content services serve their clients more effectively. So they view the world through a process lens to say, here are the processes that are most important for serving our customers. And by the way, content is important in those processes. Another one that spoke uh, is FINRA. FINRA stands for Financial Regulatory uh, Agency and or Authority. And it's actually a not exactly governmental body, but acts in that sort of capacity. 
It's funded by the banks themselves <coughs> to self-regulate the banks. And after 2008, you can imagine their workload increased dramatically, much, much bigger. In fact, what they're doing is they're taking every single transaction on the U.S. markets and storing them every day to be analyzed. Every single transaction. So they are AWS's perhaps largest customer where they will spin up thousands of new instances of computers, EC2 instances, every single day. Thousands, tens of thousands. And with the push of a button. Now it doesn't happen quite that fast, but they have to be able to do that on a daily basis. And they're taking these capabilities and they're saying, you know what's really critical? Mr. AWS, Mr. Uh, Andy Jassy, who's the CEO of a AWS, we need um, content capabilities. We need a document repository because the way that we handle the information, the way that we work with the other regulators, the way that we work with banks, is we need to exchange documents on a regular basis and we want to be able to provision that just as fast. Well, that's not the business that AWS is in. So they've gone and they've built this whole infrastructure using all the capabilities of AWS, whether it's cloud formation, cloud deploy, cloud watch, S3, um, blah, 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 and uh, security. Um, they have actually added a few extra bits to their security layer because of the incredibly important um, and, and sensitive nature of the information that they're handling. But um, they are there and they're storing it. Now, it's really interesting going into the banks because um, it's like people are afraid to go into the cloud. Now, how many people here are actually now in the cloud today? Half-ish? How many are not? Yeah, so it's about 50-50, something like that. Um, now, the banks are like, we can't do that. And it's like the regulators won't like it. Well, the regulators are there. Look, <laughs> they're storing all this stuff in AWS. They recognize that sometimes somebody like Amazon can actually protect their data better than they can. And it's uh, sort of the swarm notion. There's so many machines out there, which one do you target if you wanted to get that, get access to that information? So things are changing very rapidly. Now, on this, you can see elements of a digital business platform. So what is that digital business platform? It's a platform uh, for providing digital services that enable businesses to quickly uh, build the next generation of applications, digital applications. These applications are simple in design, mobile first. They're connected to other systems, not just content and service, uh, content and process. They're self-monitoring as well, so that you don't need a lot of intervention, and they automatically adapt to do to new business uh, requirements. And then they'll use the latest technologies to integrate with other systems and scale to any business requirements in terms of throughput, concurrency, and distribution. Now, what about those apps? Now, there's two sides to this equation. There's a whole set of operational efficiency applications, those that are more internal and actually do things like digitizing paper or um, uh, publish digital assets internally or integrate with your enterprise applications like SAP or Oracle um, or it might be product design or whatever. Then there's a whole set of digital applications that are focused more outside. So customer engagement, so uh, website marketing, uh, sales and CRM, health records, uh, claims processing, things like that. Now, what are the characteristics that are common between these? One is that they are task-centric. Task the smaller, more focused, actually the easier it actually is to do, but they're also very content-rich. They're mobile first, they're very focused and they're intuitive, kind of smaller in scope, and makes it easier, faster to be able to build these things. They're automating manual tasks. They're, they're looking at the things that can be automated and automating them, and those that can try to minimize the impact on people. 
then they take everything in context. And this is where the power comes in. If you have context of what's going on, then you can deliver information automatically or connect it to the right processes. And then they're also hopefully fast to be able to deliver those solutions. They're part of a larger ecosystem that is not just al fresco and activity. And they're also connected to other apps and digital services. And then this is also very important for that feedback loop and for that general cycle, the dynamo effect, they're measured and optimized. So we, we want to be able to take and measure them, and then we want to be able to do analysis on them. Now, these apps, if they have a common uh, process model, and if they have common uh, content or information models, that will allow them to connect up together. And you can see the elements of the digital business platform coming together by being able to hook these things together. So this is what we mean by a digital business platform. And you're going to see a lot less of just content. Or, well, first of all, Gartner has declared enterprise content management is dead. Long live content services. <coughs> it, it's sort of ironic because I tried to have this conversation with Gartner about this very subject about 10 years ago. But no, 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 they, <laughs> they, you know, they know best. Anyway, we're finally there. and. Um, it's also process services. It's not just about BPM anymore. The words management don't mean quite what they used to, and enterprise certainly doesn't mean what it used to either. But this is kind of what I talked about last year, which is process, content, search, governance, analytics. Those are all important elements to that digital platform, and all the things that are there to support it, like storage, identity management, transformation, and whatever, and do it in such a package that it's easy to deploy in the cloud. But that's not all, because more and more, I'm, I'm getting asked, can you make this work with Slack? Because that is our internal collaboration platform. Or can I hook it into Twilio, so I can get text messages, or I can send out emails, or respond to emails um, as a result of doing collaboration with my partners and my customers. Or maybe I need to hook into my e-commerce systems or my ERPs or whatever. So other services are part of the digital business platform. We will provide elements of the digital business platform, but what we provide is not the entire digital business platform. Basically, it has to encompass everything that the customer needs in terms of digital capabilities. And when we platformize this, we have the basis as well for introducing new technologies as well. Things like artificial intelligence, which is just now starting to have an impact uh, on a lot of enterprise systems. Things like natural language processing, uh, image recognition, or blockchain in, in ways that people hadn't even imagined before. But if we want to make this accessible, and we want to make sure that people can build this, you know, who have not just Java skills, but actually have a broad range, you know, maybe a higher level set of skills, but perhaps know the business a little bit better, then you have things like the design language and methodologies that are part of it, the UX libraries, the components, um, app frameworks, JavaScript APIs, and and things that make it easier to be able to build using like JavaScript level skills, uh, web front end application development skills. So now why would Alfresco be the best for something like this? Well, I, I think we have some real advantages which actually comes from our open and open source roots. One is obviously we're open source, open standards, open architecture. You know, that's been the hallmark of what Alfresco is from the beginning. And we focused on making it easy and invisible, being in the background as much as possible and just automating using things like rules and actions um, to be able to take and connect as necessary. We also want to focus on making it fast to make and, uh, de and to deploy those applications. In fact, um, time to value is, is the key phrase that we use internally here. And then 
when you ask our customers why do they buy Alfresco, you will hear this phrase more than anything else. It just integrates with everything. It's just much easier to integrate. They also use phrases like, I can just make it do what I need it to do, which often is just another way of saying it integrates with everything. Now, um, who here was, uh, Mr. T was their favorite character? <laughs> okay, how about Murdoch? Face? Face man? Uh, not so much, but some. Okay, and uh, Hannibal? All right. <laughs> um, in doing research for this presentation, uh, I, I'm amazed to find that the most active community out of those four characters is actually Murdoch. And, and you go back and watch these episodes on YouTube, he's actually pretty funny, so uh, you should go back. Anyway, yes, yes, fool! <laughs> yes, we've been doing that ever since 2005, right? But no, it's, um, it, this was something that Chris Kitchener pulled up. It was uh, 2014, um, and I'm sure I can come up with diagrams of a digital business platform that are uh, much older than that. But here's what we see when we look at this today, is we have these um, two main products, which is Alfresco and Activity. And as open source projects, that's exactly the way they will remain for forever. Um, however, um, what you will hear us talking about from a commercial perspective is more just talking about Alfresco content services and Alfresco process services powered by activity. So we want to be able to create this bigger platform here and broader platform and be able to hook it into all the different types of interfaces. Now these hook into things like Alfresco in the cloud, uh, the ASRs and FSRs and whatever, and then these sit on top of some basic services of database and identity, transform, <coughs> and file stores with a lot of clients that we've created over the years and a lot of integrations and what we've been developing as the new application development framework, which is based upon Angular and with a set of components and using uh, uh, material design as a way of creating it. So this is the digital business platform as it exists today. Now what you will see more of is deployment in the cloud. Um, we're doing a lot more to specifically make it work with AWS first. And um, we've heard some terms about all in on AWS. Uh, probably the best way of uh, describing this is AWS first. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't be doing um, Azure or that we won't be doing Google Cloud. In fact, we have customers using both those platforms today. But by far the most demand right now is for AWS. So how many people here are using AWS today? Uh, looks like uh, almost two thirds, somewhere between half and two thirds. How about Azure? Um, not quite a quarter. Google Cloud. All right, um, and if you look at the statistics, um, Azure is growing very rapidly. Uh, you have to hand it to uh, Satya Nadella that um, he grabbed the, the, the strategy and is running with it. Um, but uh, it, you're more likely to see a SharePoint in that environment than you are anything that looks like open source or Java. So it's kind of our, in our interest to probably think about AWS more. But in government, you see a lot of Azure out there. Now, in terms of deploying that, you will see containerization being really important. I've been talking about Docker for quite a while, and we are making progress on <coughs> Docker. Docker is going to be one of the primary ways in which activity is deployed, um, and you know that's the plan for being able to take and deploy Alfresco in multiple environments. Containers are ways of isolating you from the various cloud platforms overall, um, but you know, DevOps becomes a more important element to what we do. And productizing <coughs> and uh, packaging those DevOps capabilities is also important as well. Um, and these will sit on other types of capabilities 
that may be cloud-based as well. So um, you've probably seen a lot of what we've been doing with Aurora. And there's a lot you don't even need to do with Aurora because it's a managed service. And it se it's seemingly indestructible as well in terms of the way that it just kind of automatically recovers between multiple availability zones. Um, but we're also experimenting as well. Um, and it looks very promising with DynamoDB as a NoSQL database. So it turns out that the way we store things in Alfresco as nodes actually lends itself fairly well to um, NoSQL databases. Now, we can also use SQL databases where we need transactions, and we will use them. So that's things that NoSQL doesn't do very well, particularly things like uh, parent-child relationships, but that's not everything that's in Alfresco. In terms of the actual objects themselves, we can store potentially infinite numbers of objects inside of Alfresco and store their content in infinitely large sizes in S3. And the potential is absolutely enormous to be the most scalable content repository in the world. Now, in those platforms, though, we do sometimes run into issues. And I think anybody who's in this business who has both a process and a content set of capabilities has kind of run into this. And um, usually, it's just like, well, it's up to the customer to figure out how do these things work together. Um, you know, sometimes there's a mismatch in terms of APIs, in terms of user interfaces, styles, and everything else. But the value added, if these two work together well, is enormous. And they will work together well. So um, basically, when you can share metadata between process and content, and when you can share events, share logic, share analytics between them, then you can also get things like common search, common actions, common security, common insight across the board that is just something that the two of them alone cannot have. So imagine you look at the process that creates content and you can also measure how content is being used. You have a way of measuring the productivity of your digital systems as a result of it. These working together as well make it much easier to integrate with your internal enterprise integrations as well as your cloud integrations and also to be able to have a consistent set of APIs to build applications. Now the problem comes into the, the world view of these things. So how many people here are very familiar with Alfresco? Okay. How many people here are very familiar with activity? That's not bad. That's not bad, but it's nowhere near a majority there. Um, the content world kind of <coughs> is the center of the universe is the content itself, or the containers of those content, which are things like folders, possibly smart folders. Also, you can have search, which will yield a whole collection of content or whatever. But based upon that content, you have metadata and rules and, and events and actions and ACLs for security and stuff like that. But the process world is completely different. In fact, uh, you know, if you go without knowing that somebody is uh, ECM or BPM or whatever, if you go into a customer and just describe your, your information management requirements, you're more likely to hear them describe it in the context of process anyway, where the center of the universe of the process world is tasks. And tasks are connected to processes. You can also find them via search. The tasks have context, which allows them to attach metadata and uh, data from other systems. It allows them to make automatic decisions using rules, uh, connect to, uh, you, to other data models, to other uh, enterprise systems. Uh, and then their security is based upon roles, which doesn't necessarily map uh, quite that easily to the content world. So the opportunity is to build a set of common models to tie these two worlds together. And that will be critical for this digital business platform. Starting with the models themselves, you know, having a common place where we're storing the definitions of content, the definitions of the process, 
will allow us to have common events, common audit trails, common analytics, common search, and then this notion of case being the, uh, the thing that kind of binds content and tasks together, and then be able to reuse things like rules as well. So when you get these things working together, these are the elements that must work together, and this is part of the roadmap going forward. If we do this right, <coughs> then there is a really big market that's out there right now. Lots of gold, and Mr. T's golden rule, the man with the gold rules. <laughs> so, um, and, and you gotta get both sides, you know. I've noticed one bicep is slightly smaller than the other there, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, who, who am I to make that comment? Um, no, so it's, these numbers I think are actually fairly conservative. They're from IDC and relatively recently. Um, it, the, both Gartner and Forrester actually believe that the content services business is much, much bigger than that, perhaps as much as twice as big as that. And you can probably extrapolate that. But that's not a bad number. Essentially doubling your opportunity if you make these things work together well. But for us, process has been where the growth is. That's the fastest growing part of the business overall. And the real opportunity for process as well is up in the cloud. Sorry, it's just I had to get cloud in there. I had to get Murdoch in there as well. But uh, here's a really good example. So uh, in the UK, the National Health Service is broken up into many different trusts. And one of them is in Liverpool, uh, Liverpool Women's Hospital. And they've been using traditional uh, content management tools and BPM tools. And the problem is that these tools require specialists. They require business analysts to walk around and follow the nurses and the doctors and find out what's going on. And they, they said there has to be a better way to do this. Because <laughs> for them, process is everything. And what they wanted to be able to do was empower the nurses to be able to do that. And that's exactly what they've been able to do because the processes aren't that complicated, but the nurses know much better than the business analysts or probably the doctors as well in terms of what needs to be done and how to do it. So actually empowering those people to be able to do that has a, a really profound impact in terms of their, um, not just their efficiency of their software systems, but of the hospital itself to make it more effective. This is a brand new hospital, so they had an opportunity to rethink this um, from a completely different perspective, and as a result, just made it far more efficient. Now, that's all the services and capabilities. Now, sometimes you just need to paint a really pretty face on the whole thing and to start to build applications. Now, for us, um, Perhaps sometimes things don't seem like they're coming out that fast. <clears throat> some of the things are somewhat hidden, and, but incredibly important. And one of those things is the API. So the public API is, is where we start first with all these things. Because if we make the public APIs right, it doesn't matter what you're building the applications in, you will be able to consume it. Um, Dave Webster was telling me yesterday that I guess they did a, a um, uh, hackathon uh, exercise where they actually hooked in if then else uh, connecting it to the new governance services so you can just automatically declare a record using the new public APIs um, with something as you know uh, consumer like as if then else and, and so th there's a lot of work that we need to do to make it compatible with the future and go to make sure that we can grow with it, but this is the place you start. And then you can start doing the open source, open driven design and development. Now we chose um, material design because it makes sense to choose a methodology. It doesn't mean that you have to use it, but having a, a design methodology certain, certainly helps and is much more efficient and effective than us inventing our own. And of course what you want are JavaScript, HTML5, CSS3 types of structures where you can start to have an application framework, uh, user experience libraries, user interface components, uh, device responsive libraries as well so you can make it mobile first. 
uh, as well as having some basic data service and uh, um, context and connections to the various underlying systems. And then it's up to you in terms of what are the IDEs you want to use, what are the app studios, um, or, the, or the methodologies that you want to be able to use. But then there's the REST APIs that will allow you to be able to build those applications. And it's got to be not just our stuff, not just the content and the process. It's going to be your directory services. It's going to be search. It's going to be collaboration. It's going to be whatever you need it to be to be part of your digital business applications. This is your <coughs> digital business platform, not just our digital business platform that incorporates all the digital capabilities, which is why it's really important to have an open framework that can potentially build out to connect to anything. Uh, anything that is, is capable of uh, delivering a RESTful API. <laughs> and then, hopefully over time, we can collect up some standard models and make that much easier overall. Now, in terms of those components, if you look at that content world and the process world, well, there's some components that are kind of obvious. You know, document library, document details, inboxes, viewers, search fields, uh, search forms, search results, menus, actions. These are the things that basically any content management application. Likewise, the process world has its similar forms of inboxes, uh, the process start and design, tasks, and things like that. Now, if we can build out the components to help glue these things together, then that makes it far more effective for you to be able to build these digital business platforms that incorporate the core capabilities of content and process. And so that's the direction that we want to be able to take these. So if I take the example of the Don Tracker that I started with before, there's elements of content, there's elements of process. We just need to be able to compose this and build it and pull it together. So we're going to be building this kind of application as sort of a, well, I, I use the term canonical application. Canonical is a mathematical term, which means exemplary or, or um, a, you know, just an example of something. So think of it as the example application, because everybody gives me a hard time when they call it the canonical application. But uh, it will be a canonical application that you can learn from, that will show you how these things compose, how it works, and will actually do something useful out of the box. What Dawn Tracker is, is uh, it's a US military thing of, here's an order, sailors, you go do it. <coughs> it's a group of people you assign, they collaborate, they pull stuff together, they have their process, and when it's all done, out comes a record at the other end. That's something that's actually very useful for virtually any enterprise, probably. And we want to make this as open source as possible as well. Make sure that, you know, we hope you will be contributing some of the components that can be that can help in the um, composing of these types of applications. So that's the digital business platform. But beyond that, where where are we going? Now, you know, this is probably the latest technology back in 1983 or whatever in the back of a van. And it's it's kind of interesting that as a plot device, you still have people sitting in the van listening to what's going on uh, in spy films and detective programs and whatever. It's just the equipment has changed. Now, I actually had a reel-to-reel -reel once upon a time. Has anybody else had a reel-to-reel -reel at any given time? <laughs> and was there a reason for that? <laughs> Was it like old crap? <laughs> well, it was, it was one of the choices I had. It was a hand-me-down from my dad. I, I couldn't afford a cassette player back then, certainly not an 8-track. Um, so um, now, how is the digital business platform going to evolve? Uh, very carefully. Um, so here's a sort of blanked out view of some of the diagrams that we've been looking. But it's. It's going to be an evolving architecture. We have considered the, the impact of what would happen if we just said, let's think radically differently. You know, let's just start from scratch and say, here's two somewhat compatible integrated, you know, different types of systems that integrate. 
that doesn't work. And you can certainly see the, the consequences for Documentum trying to do that with the LEAP application. Um, it took five years and nothing happened. And it's still not clear how those two will actually integrate. Um, but what is clear is that we want a focus of this to be the content, process, and governance coming together as consistent, but equal components that can work independently, but actually work much better as a whole. There will be a lot more investment in insight and intelligence. And we're going to be designing this cloud first, because that's the way this stuff's going to get deployed in the future. You know, it's going to be containerized. It's going to be cloud deployable. And DevOps is going to have to be an important element to the actual design of what we do. Um, and of course, it's going to be open source. You know, the open source is still important to what we do. But it's that insight intelligence that actually gets me up in the morning and says, you know, makes me think, yeah, this is still a really interesting space. And I'll give you an example. So FINRA presented this slide of what they want to be able to do. So they're bringing in like complaints and forms and stuff like that that have uh, publicly identifiable information, which is you know things like social security numbers, date of birth, names, children, whatever that might be part of this. And they want to be able to find those and detect it and have the opportunity to blank it out. They want to be able to take these big, long scripts and summarize them. They want to be able to take and automatically classify to rec recognize, hey, this is an investor complaint uh, with confidence of 93%. By the way, when you get into ranges of 93%, that exceeds the ability of human beings to do exactly that sort of thing. Uh, to extract entity information of things like name of the people, the, the, what firm do they belong to, and, and what's their broker numbers or whatever. And then also to find relevant, and that's a really important key word, relevant other documents that are very similar to what they're doing. Now, th that's nice to have, um, but it's still an area of research. You know, the whole notion of machine learning, contextual analysis, integrated analytics, natural <coughs> language processing, that's still new stuff that's in development, but the, the desires there of auto-classification, auto-organization, summarization, recommendations are there. So what we're doing is uh, we're, we're doing research in this area. We, we've actually worked with Emory University that um, is doing a lot of stuff in natural language processing. Um, they're doing stuff with what is known as traditional natural language processing and also with the latest deep learning stuff as well. And when you look at what's out there and how quickly it's changing, when people talk about machine learning, I have to ask, are you talking about machine learning before 2006 or since 2006 or machine learning since 2012? Because it is changing so rapidly. Um, I won't read everything that's on there, but um, some of the old-fashioned, there's, it's called, um, in, in the in, well, in the field of research, it's called GoFi, good old-fashioned AI, which is just rules-based. You know, that's the old prologue stuff, and it's still around. It still has its purposes. Um, there's a lot of statistical <coughs> processing, which what is what a lot of people mean by uh, machine learning. But supervised machine learning is usually what people mean by machine learning, which is actually taking and doing statistical models looking at what potential output is, having training sets, and trying to train these things to do stuff. But what's really different now is deep learning. Um, deep learning kind of changed um, almost a decade ago, uh, but it's been moving very rapidly. And the thing that has really changed it is the cloud. It's not that the algorithms have changed that much. It's the fact that you can apply a 1,000 processors if you need it. And even more importantly, these things actually use linear algebra. And I don't mean linear algebra like in your secondary school or high school. I mean like uh, second, third order differential equations where you're trying to optimize in a multi-space, multi-dimensional space and, and try to figure out how can you smooth out a curve type of linear algebra, which was, that's when I gave up on math when I was at university. <laughs> 
I don't know about you. How many people actually took that course in uh, in vector vector calculus and stuff like that? And, and how many people actually still remember anything from it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can still do an integral to this day. I'm not sure. Um, and I kind of wish I, I paid a little bit more attention to that. But um, it's really interesting to see somebody from like Facebook, Jan LeCun, who's been in this business for uh, about two, two and a half decades now. He's at Facebook and he's doing some of the image analysis stuff. He heads up the AI group there. And uh, there was a new thing that he actually got really excited about. And it's something that also Apple has been kind of brought them out into the open instead of doing closed AI type of stuff, is this notion of ad, uh, generative adversarial networks. What that means is two computers playing against each other. In other words, one machine uh, training another machine. And that's one, of the, that's one of the bottlenecks of these things, is how fast can you train these algorithms? And you've got the machinery, but now when you have machines training each other, he kind of thinks like, maybe we're kind of over the hump for general purpose artificial intelligence. We don't know yet, but it sure looks promising. And uh, so there, this stuff is changing so fast, and it hurts my head when I go and look at it. Um, I have to take a nap usually after I read this stuff. Uh, but uh, its applications are actually going to be really interesting in natural language processing. I think one of the first areas you're going to see it is in um, uh, fake news, you know, as a way of detecting fake news. Um, and Facebook is trying to recruit people to help in that process. Um, there's also autonomous bots um, that are out there. So the user interface actually being question and answers as a way of interfacing. So there's a lot going on here. Now, um, I know I'm going to, see, I, I get so excited about this. I'm, I'm using up all my time on this one. I'm sorry about that. But um, we're almost done here. But uh, Solar actually is a pretty good platform to introduce this stuff. Why? It's not because Solar itself is AI, but it's a framework that can hook in other classifiers and analyzers. And it's actually pulling apart the data anyway, stripping it, lemmatizing it, and whatever, to put it into a form that some of these AI and natural language algorithms need. So this is a great place to start with this stuff by introducing uh, the streaming expressions, machine learning, maybe some of the basic machine learning to begin with, some of the uh, traditional natural language processing stuff to plug in. But there's more that we can do. Now, how are we representing this to the outside world? You know, like one, can, one single vehicle, I had to get the van in there at some point. One single vehicle with everything and everybody in it. Well. This is the way we're presenting it, is the Alfresco Digital Business Platform. Yes, it's a lot of the things you've seen in the past. It's going to be packaged in a different way. And they're going to, we're introducing capabilities to make these things work better than they ever have before. Uh, Alfresco Process Services, Alfresco Content Services, Governance Services, Intelligence and Analytics, and then the new Application Development Framework on top of that. And what's so different about this? is that, well, it's the digital business platform. That's what we're calling it right now. It's platform mindset. It's a design thinking mindset. Um, it's, we're, we're not trying to be in the solutions business. We're trying to make it possible for you to quickly create these solutions. And it's also about thinking about cloud first. How can we make this work with new capabilities that perhaps, like GPUs and whatever, that you may not be able to get on board. So again, there's the mnemonic of the things I talked about today, mm -hmm. cloud, app development, process, and content. That is the A team. And when this all comes together, it'll just work perfectly, because I love it when a plan comes together. And that's all, folks. Thank you very much. And I, I did have to do one. I've been in the pool! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Boris, I don't know if we have time for questions. No.
Okay. Okay, because I'm I'm gonna have to leave at uh, one o'clock today. Okay, so we have time for three questions then. <laughs> three questions. <laughs> um, John, yes. you are busy talking about cloud first. Um, what's your view on serverless? Okay, um, actually serverless, I, th I think it's still kind of early for serverless in general, but there's a lot of things that we can take advantage in serverless. Serverless, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, it's called Lambda <laughs> on AWS, and basically it's like, here's some code, just go execute it. It's usually small, concise, and it's gonna be really good for things like, um, uh, for actions, to just be able to say and process an action. So. I, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, I, that's probably one of the first areas we might see something like that. Yeah, so actions, um, the content side, but also system tasks in the process side. Yeah, uh, do you want to, you, you can just repeat what you just said, so. <laughs> yeah, so in the content side, uh, there are actions and they lend themselves very well to lambdas. Uh, on the process side, we have system tasks and they also lend themselves well to being executed. We don't really care where they're executed, we just yeah. care that they are executed. Yeah, so uh, t uh, automated tasks in activity, can that's another natural place for it to play out. So we, we are actively looking at it. It's not like we can take and decompose the whole application. When I talked about a radical rethink, that was a radical rethink, which I don't think would have that many benefits <laughs> if we were to do the entire thing serverless, but it definitely plays a role especially in terms of extending the system. Do we have other questions? <coughs> Hello. Uh, maybe a little bit about uh, personal numbers, the newest numbers, how big the company is, uh, maybe a little bit about employees, uh, staff, uh, working with partners, and such things. Um, I think the last number I saw was about 423 people. Um, I've heard uh, Doug talk about us being just a little under $100 million. So that's kind of about the, the size that we're at right now in terms of revenue, um, which by and large, a lot of that is recurring revenue. So it's a good, strong stream of business going forward. Um, so that, that's all looking pretty good. A uh, number of partners, we've been, I would say, a bit more selective in our partners, and we've been getting more larger partners that are global. That doesn't mean that we're, we're giving up or, or degrading existing partners, because it, there's often a symbiosis between the larger partners who can get into a lot of the bigger deals, but need the implementation capability of some of the smaller partners uh, that are out there. So how many how many people are with a partner or system integrator here? A little more than half, I think. Yeah. Okay. So one last question. <coughs> John, may I ask you about plans uh, about uh, moving forward with activity inside Alfresco One? I mean. Uh, you have separated Alfresco, oh, sorry, activity to uh, uh, another product, and activity inside Alfresco One is not moving forward. And yeah. Okay. New functionality. Do you have any plans about it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, activity. So the question was, um, do we have any plans specifically about activity? There's an embedded activity, and then there's activity outside. Um, there's. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why you don't necessarily want activity embedded in there doing a lot of things it could potentially do. Um, also, I think we need to be able to take activity and evolve it in the direction that activity needs to go, which might be somewhat different than being embedded inside of Alfresco <laughs> itself. So we're not in a position to just say we're going to turn off <laughs> embedded activity. Embedded activity has to work. There's some things that uh, 
that a lot of our customers are focused on. But what you'll see is more emphasis on activity outside, sitting next to it, and um, uh, more of a decoupling of the architecture itself, and more asynchronous types of interactions between uh, activity and alfresco itself uh, as a service architecture. One very last question here. Hi, John. Um, I've got a fairly small team, and I spent some time teaching them all about iCal, and then suddenly all the new Angular stuff comes out. I spent time helping them get activity processes running inside our fresco, then suddenly we've got the external one going. Um, is there any plan support for helping the community move into the new way? help us upskill our teams rather than just saying, hey, there's this new Angular thing and we're going, oh, but we've only just finished learning iCal and how do we get from here to there? Yeah, well, uh, one of the issues with iCal is that we would have to provide you the entire education package right from the get-go of everything. And the, the reason for going at an architecture that has you know tools that are more widely adopted is because the parts that you need to, after they just do the basic Angular uh, instructions, the part that they need for Alfresco and for Activity, are going to be much, much smaller than the whole thing. It can be very focused on, on the specifics of how these things glue together. And hopefully we build the components that just make it like, well, most of that instruction is just use these components. Um, in terms of something like moving from embedded to external, um, First of all, I, I don't know how long we, ha we will support that or how long it will take, but it will probably be, tradition says it will probably be a very long time you know, that before we can actually go off of embedded activity. Uh, what we can do is we can make it easier, um, create some patterns and, and some interfaces to make it possible to move it from internal to external, although the operating model may end up actually being different in general, but I, I think we need to make best efforts to make that transition uh, easier. Now, what we have done when we've introduced new architectures of things like solar, and when we do introduce NoSQL, what we can do is migration in place. If there's any possibility to do migration in place, then we can do that. I'm, I'm, I just can't, I don't think that would be an easy thing for that, that particular one, but um, I, I think in general it's the right direction to go to say let's be more open, let's be more, let's go with a platform that more people know than what is just alfresco specific and to, we do have to move the architecture forward which means different architectural patterns than the past, which means it's going to become more of a microservice architecture, actually some elements becoming serverless as we discussed before, but you know just best we can do is educate as much as possible and make that transition as easy as possible. Okay, so thank you very much, John.